15 eagle is the tip of a spear that defends the tiny nation of Israel. 80 eagles serve in the Israeli Air Force, and the pilots who fly them average more sorties than any other combat aviators in the world. They are renowned for being brazen and callous. It is for good reason. Upon the wings of these aircraft and the shoulders of these men lies the fate of the nation. They are the vanguard of a country that is smaller than 46 of the 50 states. A country that has fought six wars of survival over the past 40 years. Every Israeli citizen must serve in the military. All are aware of being surrounded by nations that in times past have vowed to wipe their homeland off the face of the earth. There's no uh, depth and, uh, and distance from uh, air bases in Israel and any target to the border is a question uh, of minutes uh, when considering flying a fighter aircraft. We uh, have to bear in mind that it's also uh, the other way around. A hostile enemy aircraft which would take off from Damascus, from Amman, even from H3. Once it reaches close uh, to our borders and penetrates, it's a question of uh, minutes, sometimes seconds even. Enemy jets can depart air bases in Cairo and in less than three minutes cross the Israeli border. From Damascus they can do so in two minutes and from Amman, Jordan, just 45 seconds. Every inch of land here has a settlement, a village, a town, and we have to defend the population. Therefore, we prefer, if it's possible, to fight all the wars outside the Israeli borders. That's the philosophy, and until today, we kept to that. This strategy means that Israeli air bases are considered the front line of the nation's defense. Their most potent weapon of survival is the American-made F-15. This $60 million air superiority fighter is the best the world has ever seen. In the past 20 years, Israeli pilots flying F-15 Eagles have racked up over 50 enemy kills to zero losses of their own. No other pilot aircraft coupling in modern history can even approach this. Financial constraints and the confines of Middle East airspace create a unique set of parameters for IAF warplanes. Israeli F-15 pilots do not rely on BVR, or beyond visual range technology. Unlike American pilots who are taught to destroy the enemy at the greatest range possible, Israeli pilots do not have the luxury of distance. Instead, they are taught they must obtain visual contact before engaging. Normally, if you don't build an aircraft in your own country according with your specific needs, then you get something that you pay for and it really was designed for somebody else's need. Even if it's a very advanced aircraft for a very advanced country, there are specific problems that you have to solve by yourself. Less sophistication means greater reliability something prized by the budget-strapped Israelis. Because of this, the IAF jet is really just a stripped-down version of the American F-15. The size of a World War II bomber, it is nearly a third titanium. Despite its bulk, the F-15 is one of the fastest combat aircraft ever built. With two Pratt & Whitney F-100 engines, the jet boasts a combined thrust of nearly 60,000 pounds and a top speed of 1,700 miles an hour. When on full afterburner, the Eagle consumes nearly 900 pounds of fuel a minute. F-15s first came to Israel in 1976, and because they arrived on the Sabbath, the government that bought them actually fell. When the first pilots were finally assigned to fly them, the weight of their obligation 
was clear. I remember when the first team came back from the United States, there was a new hospital uh, building at that time in Haifa. And the cost of this building was $25 million, the same price of an F-15 aircraft at that time. And I remember that this point really was in my mind during the first year as an F-15 pilot, knowing that I'm driving in hospital. Israeli fighter pilots are arguably the best in the world. They are, without question, the most battle-hardened. Between 1966 and 1991, they suffered less than 25 losses to 631 air combat victories. Victories over pilots from nearly every Arab nation, from the Soviet Union and even Korea. In Israeli culture, they are revered as the guardians of the realm, and from an early age, most young men dream of joining their ranks. People are the most valuable asset of any organization. It has been said that uh, human beings are the most uh, sophisticated piece of machinery ever produced by an unskilled, by very willing labor force, but still it takes 18 years to bring one up to scratch. And it takes another five years to make him a good fighter pilot. And that's your most valued asset. Although it's uh, not very, it's not very expensive to make, but it's very expensive to keep. By American standards, they are extremely young. They go into the academy at the tender age of 18. And by their early 20s, they will be flying a $60 million warplane. Of the hundreds who begin air cadet training, only a dozen will ever graduate. We used to educate our pilot that any time you meet with an enemy pilot, you should consider him as the best pilot in the world. No matter who he is, where he comes from, what is his capability, you should consider him as the best in the world. That's one thing. And the other thing is, look around, the one who, whom you don't see is the one who might kill you. You have to have some level of fear. I don't know if the word fear is the right definition, but you have to worry a little bit. When I uh, trained the young pilots, I used to tell them, listen, if you want to survive as a fighter pilot, it's always good to be a little bit paranoid. A little bit, not too much. Because otherwise, if you have no fear at all, you might, during training uh, time, take uh, higher risk. Paranoia in the state of Israel runs deep. Security concerns are far greater and precautions much more extreme than in the United States Air Force. Because of this, it is forbidden to show the face of an active Israeli Air Force pilot on camera. They are trained in Western tactics, flying Western planes. Perhaps even more than American pilots, they are taught the value of rugged discipline in tandem with the merits of innovation and initiative. We never give our uh, pilots precise instructions how to act in battle. We give the general idea, we direct them to the combat zone, and once they acquire the target with their radars, they are free to decide how to attack the target. The freedom of choice and freedom of decision, that's the name of the game, and so we train our pilots. After three years of intense training, after seeing nine out of ten of their classmates wash out, they finally graduate. From this select group of young men will arise future generals of the Air Force and leaders of the state, but only a few will enter the elite ranks of the most privileged class in Israel, the F-15 fighter squadrons of the IAF. McDonnell Douglas aircraft they hope to fly is state-of-the-art with a combat range of 1200 miles and a ceiling of 65,000 feet the Eagle can travel at two and a half times the speed of sound 
When it comes to the F-15, I would say, I have, like, uh, if with the F-4 I have more, like, memories, some friends uh, who never got back from, from the battlefield and things like that. It comes to the F-15 and everything is glory and success and victory without any failures and you know like you jump into an airplane by the time you're in the airplane you take off you know that uh, at the area where you are you have superiority and again it's a connection between you and the airplane you come from a group of pilots which considered as the best and I think that they are good and you fly the airplane which is the best in the world and it's a good teaming altogether so if I go by an F-15, my smile, and I think, wow, that's, this was a good teaming. And if I go by an F-4, I think, wow, this was a tough mission. The F-15 is Israel's premier aerial platform, but its workhorse is the F-4 Phantom. Phantoms arrived in the Middle East in 1969 and first saw combat fighting Egyptian MiGs over the Sinai in the war of attrition that lasted from 1969 to 1970. In July of 1970, Phantoms took part in one of the most renowned engagements of that war. Ten years later, during peace talks in Washington, D.C., the Israelis listened as Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, himself a former MiG pilot, reminisced about the air battle in which Soviet MiG-21 advisors, who had criticized their Egyptian students, were finally allowed to fly against the Israelis. Mr. Mubarak is telling us, look, we let them fly and one day you shot down five Russians over southern Egypt, which is true. This is what we did. The same evening, all the bases of the Egyptian's air force in the bars, the pilot was celebrating the victory of the Israelis over the Egyptians. And I'm talking about the war of attrition. <laughs> Egyptian benevolence and Israeli air superiority would not last long. By 1973, leaders in Cairo were preparing new plans and new weapons for the final battle. One that would wipe out a third of the Israeli air force and nearly crush the life out of the Jewish state. By the spring of 1980, it is a daily event. F-15 Eagles patrol the nation's northern border to stand vigil against marauding Syrian warplanes. But the frontier stretches for miles and the settlements along it are never totally immune to attack. Soon, war calls once again on the nation of Israel. This time, the focus is on the northern border with Lebanon. Here, Palestinian guerrillas, intent on regaining their homeland, have attacked several kibbutzim on the frontier. In April of 1980, PLO terror squads make their way onto the Mizgavam kibbutz. Here, several children are held hostage, and one is subsequently killed. This is followed by months of rocket attacks that by June of 1982, finally push the Israeli government to launch an invasion some had seen coming for over a year. In 1981, there was a spate of attacks by the PLO from southern Lebanon on northern Israel. One element or one result of those attacks was something that the Israeli military censor would not allow to be published and would not allow foreign correspondents to report. And that was that Israelis were fleeing from the northern town of Metula. 
because it was too dangerous to live there. In the Israeli ideology, which existed since the building of the state, the notion that Jews would retreat from territory they had settled was simply anathema and unacceptable. Initially, the war in Lebanon is fought almost entirely between Israeli ground units and PLO militia. Israeli warplanes are limited to air-to-ground assaults, which they engage in with ferocious determination. F-4s, Skyhawks, and F-16s take on the bulk of the work as F-15s fly MiG-CAP missions overhead. Syria occupies nearly half of Lebanon. At first, they warily accept Israel's claim that the invasion is meant to carve out a 40-mile buffer zone in southern Lebanon and nothing more. PLO defenses are spirited but hopelessly outgunned and soon swept away. As Israeli columns close in on the Beirut-Damascus highway, the true objectives of the invasion are revealed. Not only to destroy the PLO, but also establish a Christian puppet state in Lebanon, eliminating Syria as a power broker in the region. Leaders in Damascus find it an intolerable proposition. Once Israeli forces pass beyond the 40-mile security zone, F-15 pilots prepare themselves for the coming conflict with Syria that many now see as inevitable. Both sides prepare for an aerial showdown. The world tenses in the face of a volatile Middle East brush fire. Full-scale war between a Soviet client state and an American ally in such a critical region could easily spread. For young Israeli pilots, there is no such apprehension. It is a moment they've waited for all of their lives. You're making so much training, and you invest so much uh, money, and so much effort, and I don't know if it's right to make the comparison, but in some sense it's like Olympics. You want to gain the medal, the gold medal, not the silver medal, and not the bronze medal. And that's the way we trained our pilot, and that's the way that they behave. When Syrian armor crashes into lead Israeli forces in the Bekaa Valley, the need for IAF air-to-ground support becomes acute. Two columns of Israeli troops find themselves on the verge of being wiped out. Suddenly, Air Force commanders face a repeat of the Sinai in 1973. Throughout the Bekaa Valley, the Syrians have placed advanced surface-to-air missile batteries similar to those that decimated the IAF nearly 10 years ago. We couldn't have done this under the umbrella of the sand batteries because, again, we would have lost uh, many aircraft. So there was no other choice but to put a preemptive attack against those sand batteries which was launched in uh, Wednesday in the afternoon after a morning of uh, collecting uh, intelligence data and updating the exact location of those uh, sand batteries which were in the Becca Valley. But the past decade has provided the Israelis with many answers to the missile dilemma. Technologies and tactics have been devised that will hopefully counter the SAM threat. A ground uh, missile is a very soft target. Once you know where it is, you track it in real time, and you approach it and you kill it like a snake. Now for that, you need that type of intelligence. You need real-time intelligence. Now I would say the array of weaponry that was developed between 1973 and 1982 has uh, brought into play so many anti-missile weapons that if you ask anybody if he wants to be a missile battery commander, when all portrayed to him what is waiting for him, nobody would want to be a missile battery commander. Answers this triggered 
from the aircraft side are formidable. But to say that the missile has bent the wing of attack aircraft, far from it. Not in my book. Our day starts very early. We never know exactly when we'll have a full house, but whatever comes up... The Israelis have engineered an ingenious but simple tactical solution. Dozens of drones will precede IF Phantoms over the valley. Decoys for the hunters that will follow. As enemy SAM sites light up to track what they think are Israeli warplanes, Phantoms will pop up over the mountains to fire anti-radiation missiles. These will then home in on the illuminated SAM radar sites. E-2C Hawkeyes provide Air Force commanders with a detailed real-time radar view of the region. Every move the Syrians make will be monitored as it happens. Hawkeyes enable Israeli intelligence to reach well into Syria. In Air Force it's very easy. Whenever you are starting your engines in any airfield in Syria and you start to communicate with the tower, we, we can tell in Israel who is speaking to whom and when he's going to take off. With eagles controlling the sky and phantoms the ground, IAF commanders orchestrate an integrated air battle that leaves the enemy bewildered. It is the antithesis of 1973. In less than an hour, the Syrian air defense umbrella is virtually annihilated. We attacked the sand batteries uh, themselves. They were found exactly where we thought they would be. And they didn't move because they were very confused. And I think it was a great surprise for them. Uh, before an hour has passed, they were destroyed. We destroyed about 13 uh, batteries and we didn't uh, lose one aircraft in that attack. The Syrians were launching interceptors to try and avoid the attacks which we had, not only on the sand batteries, but on the close air support for the ground forces. And they did it in, in a panic in some way, because they feel that they lost the, the defense of sand batteries, and now they have to launch the interceptors. For the Israelis, it is a classic engagement. Here, the F-15 Eagle comes into its own. Here, aerial combat demands near surgical precision. Pilots dare not venture into Syrian or Jordanian airspace for fear of widening the war. And in a fighter jet twisting and turning at Mach 2, this means that time and space are compressed to nearly impossible dimensions. If you measure the time and distances, meaning that sometimes you get an order to engage, to shut down airplanes, and to get back, and altogether I would say is no more than 90 seconds or, or, or two minutes. And one should uh, try to imagine what does it mean. You have to get your formation organized, you have to collect all the, uh, the intelligence information, meaning you have to have in mind the aerial picture before you get in, you have to make sure that you look around to the ground and you're not being shot by any missiles. And then you're all in, and then you have to intercept the airplanes, and then you have to see them visually, and then you have to make uh, some setup for the engagement, do your job within a couple of seconds, and press back home. As the Syrians launch more and more planes, it becomes clear that this will be an aerial engagement of great proportion. Soon, over 150 aircraft are turning in the skies over Lebanon. One third of these are F-15 Eagles. It is the largest air battle ever witnessed in the Middle East. Sending uh, young pilots to air combat activities is one of the duties of a commander and you have to have some inner strength to do it and you have a 
different knowledge of them because as a commander you fly with them. I knew them better than his mother from some point of view. So it's much easier to send them to a combat activities because you have confidence. Like the RAF pilots in the Battle of Britain, they fight with the tenacity of those who know that if they fail, their homes and families could well pay the price. For many, memories of the 73 Sam massacre still linger. Every human being is afraid. If anyone tell you that he does not afraid, ever, don't believe him. But always, I was afraid. Always. But the difference between one man to another is your ability to overcome your fearless. What you have to do, slow down, reconsider yourself in this world field, regain your power, your energy, your spirit, and you can overcome. If you can't, you shouldn't be a pilot. The dogfights continue for two days. The frantic pace of combat eases only at night. As the first 48 hours draw to a close, it becomes apparent that the Eagle has engineered a route of historic significance. The Israelis show no mercy to their Syrian adversaries. In the Middle East, chivalry is a rare commodity that most simply cannot afford. In just two days, over 40 Syrian aircraft fall to Israeli F-15s. Many of these kills are MiG-23 floggers, some of the fastest Soviet fighters ever built. It is the most one-sided aerial victory in history. In less than a week, the Syrian Air Force is demolished. The wreckage of nearly 100 Arab jets lies strewn across the Bekaa Valley. The missile has not bent the wing of the fighter, and never again would the IAF's ability to survive the Arab missile umbrella come into question. Please. Did you see the plane crash? Of course. Two planes are shoot here. And yeah, some soldier told me that's a Syrian one. Syrian plane was shot down? Yeah. But the euphoria is short-lived. Forty miles to the west, Israeli forces press home their assault on Beirut. do, the public begins to question a war that many see as not one of survival, but one of choice. The difficulties came a little later in refugee camps where there were Palestinian guerrillas uh, and the Israelis had to go in and do close in combat at times with, with, with children all over the place and, and uh, it was a very difficult, painful process. You know, they'd come home and they would uh, talk about what they had gone through and about how they had taken their APCs or their tanks into refugee camps and there were these children and soldiers started talking about seeing this kid who was uh, looked like his own son and this kind of war that involves civilians and civilian casualties was not what he had signed up for. Soon, discontent spreads to the most of the Israeli military, the pilots of the IAF. They were fighting in situations where civilians were all around. It, there was nothing antiseptic about this. Sometimes a war can be very mechanical these days with modern weapons. Even pilots were, who, you know, run the most sophisticated machines would sometimes drop their bombs in the sea instead of on their targets because they didn't believe they either they couldn't find their targets or they questioned whether their targets really had military value. Had in effect civil disobedience in the military. And that's that's quite something. Never before had pilots questioned the morality of their cause. In the Air Force, strict discipline and rigid professionalism are a way of life. But outside of Beirut, events unfold that give the men of the IAF and the entire nation of Israel reason for doubt.
In two refugee camps near Beirut, called Sabra and Shatila, over 2,500 Palestinians, mostly old men, women and children, are massacred by Christian phalangist militia. They are let in by the Israeli soldiers surrounding the camps, soldiers who are well aware of the phalangists' hatred and intent. I mean, how did you let these people come in here? If, if you are traveling here in Beirut, you know that it is a very complicated task and there is no way that you can block all the roads and all the narrow passes that are here. Despite early protests of ignorance, it soon becomes clear that the Israelis stood by for hours and turned deaf ears to the shooting and cries of the victims. In the Knesset, the seams of Israeli society begin to burst. As word of the massacre spreads, joy inspired by the Air Force victory over the Syrians gives way to outrage. Two months after the invasion, the PLO evacuates Beirut. World opinion never again looks at Israel in the same light. Even to their allies, the Israelis have gone from oppressed to oppressor. Despite having destroyed an enemy air force in just days, many view the debacle in Lebanon as anything but victory. The question, who won the war in Lebanon? It's really a difficult question because sometimes the winners lost as well. We won only on the tactical operational level, not strategically. The pain and introspection brought about by the events of 1982 linger. Here, Outside of Jerusalem lie the remains of over 1,100 airmen lost in battle since 1948. It is often said that the defeat of the Israeli Air Force would bring the death of the nation. If so, the deaths of these men have brought the nation life. The challenges they faced and solutions they found between 1973 and 1982 would have repercussions far beyond the state of Israel. Our day starts very early. We never... 15,000 Soviet-built SAM missiles. The tactics they devised stem primarily from the Israeli experiences of 1973 and 1982. After 1982, we were asked by the American military forces and mainly the American Air Force to come and uh, brief the officers of the U.S. Air Force about the way the war in the Bekaa Valley went, what worked and what didn't work, what are the lessons that we learned from that uh, war. The Bekaa Valley campaign was something that, uh, that a lot of us had, had studied pretty carefully and in fact that we were able to draw some, some lessons and some ideas directly out of the Bekaa operations and apply them to the Gulf War situation. It became quite clear that one of the major reasons for the very significant Israeli successes was that the Israelis had managed to destroy the ability of the Syrians to command their forces and to control them. Technological advances in the F-15 and other aircraft enable the Americans to not only borrow from the Israeli experience, but to expand on it. 145 Eagles will see action in the Gulf. They will take into battle the same countermeasures used by the Israelis against the Syrian missile threat, chaff and flares. And as the Israelis had over the Bekaa Valley, the Americans will employ a fleet of drones in attacking Iraqi defenses around Baghdad. This time, however, the drones will follow an initial wave of stealth aircraft meant to destroy key Iraqi air defense nodes without being detected. After the initial F-117 strikes went through, of course all the Iraqi gunners reported for work because the bombs were going off. And so now they got on their radars and turned on their SAM radars and their gun radars and they were all searching. The next thing that came through 
was Puba's party. It was a bunch of uh, targets, not aircraft, that looked like targets that looked like aircraft. They immediately shot every one of them down and dutifully reported so. But in the process, they absorbed almost 100 anti-radiation missiles going into their radars. We put fear into the heart of the Iraqi air defenders that moment, and it never left them the rest of the war. Just as important as stealth and drones, the decade following the Bekaa engagement saw terrific advances made in PGMs, or precision guided munitions. By 1991, PGMs reach a level of sophistication that enables them to paralyze Saddam Hussein's air defenses on the very first night of war. World War II, had we wanted to have a 90% probability of putting a single bomb in, say, in this room, which is, let's say it's about a 60 by 100 foot room, and had we been using B-17s with the same accuracy that they had in the campaign against Germany, we would have had to have dropped 9,000 bombs, which would have meant putting 10,000 men at risk. So what that meant in World War II if we were using that kind of technology is that we do not try to put a bomb in this room. Conversely, in the Gulf War, I can send one 117 that will drop one of its two bombs with one man at risk and have a 90% probability that the bomb will not only fall in this room, but probably will fall between the two of us, if in fact that that's what we want to do. Delivering PGMs is a task not limited to the stealth fighter. Just one week into the war, another F-15 arrives on the scene. It is the F-15E Strike Eagle. Unlike the dogfighting C model, this two-seater specializes in air-to-ground attack. By January 22nd, lantern targeting pods arrive in the Gulf that enable the 48E models in Desert Storm to deliver laser-guided munitions. The weapons information officer pinpoints the target with a laser beam. Once the 2,000-pound PGM is released, it rides the beam onto target, even after the pilot has turned to leave the area. With their missile umbrella destroyed, the Iraqis react just as their Syrian and Egyptian counterparts had. Rather than grant coalition forces control of the air, they send interceptors out to do battle. These fare no better than their predecessors over the Sinai and the Bekaa Valley. When Iraqi pilots attempt to oppose American F-15s, they die with alarming regularity. The Eagle's APG-63 radar enables pilots to tell whether incoming MiGs carry drop tanks or weapons from nearly 30 miles away. In just days, dogfighting specialist F-15 C sweep the skies of all Iraqi fighters in the region. I think that right as of right now that the F-15 record from Baqa through the Gulf War and wherever else that it may have been used is something like 100, 120 enemy airplanes shot down with zero losses. There's nothing comparable in aviation history on the air-to-air -air side to, to, to the F-15. It simply is, is superior to anything else that's out there. By war's end, American F-15Cs tally 34 MiG kills to no losses of their own. When enemy aircraft seek haven in hardened shelters below, F-15Es shatter them with laser-guided bombs. Iraq, the fourth largest military in the world, collapses beneath the massive weight of American air power. It is one of the most stunning combat aviation victories of all time. A victory that owes homage to the Air Force of a tiny nation that because of war machines like the F-15 may soon find security for the first time in its brief and violent history.